Hi, and welcome to Hope Church Online. Uh, I'm Pastor Jason, and I just want to thank you so much for watching us digitally or maybe even listening to us via podcast. We are just grateful that you are dialed in and spending these few moments with us. Um, our hope and our prayer is that this resource brings you hope as we learn to walk the way of Jesus in our everyday life. Now, I want you to think about something. Have you ever had a moment that felt like more than just a moment? A moment where maybe you could even call it otherworldly or, or transcendent. A few years ago, I was on the West Coast with some friends, and we decided to take the day and go ha hike Mount Rainier. Now, Mount Rainier is a volcano, and I've never, ever been on a volcano before, so I didn't really know what to expect. But I remember we, we pulled into Mount Rainier National Park, and we, we got there, and we get out of the car and we start on this trail and we begin at first in the woods and then it turns into sort of rocky terrain, which is kind of what I was expecting. And then we get over this ridge and as soon as we get over this ridge, all you could see for it felt like miles was just fields of wildflowers. And it was the most beautiful and gorgeous and awe-inspiring thing I've ever seen. I remember in that moment just feeling a certain weightiness to it. And even though the seconds were ticking by, each second felt like it just contained all of heaven in that moment. It was just gorgeous. Another time I felt this was um, on August 6th, um, 2005, when uh, that Saturday around 5 p.m., I'm standing in this church and the doors open up and my gorgeous wife begins walking down the aisle. And I just remember watching her take each step and just thinking about how each of those steps was a transcendent moment and seeing the look on her face and thinking, man, I get to spend the rest of my life with this amazing woman. Another time was when my children were born and, and you're just looking at this little bundle of humanity that shares your DNA and you're staring into their face and thinking, oh my gosh, this moment just feels otherworldly. Sometimes these moments are awe-inspiring like this and just feel awesome and, and wonderful. And sometimes these moments of transcendence are a little less glorious. A few weeks ago, I was driving down um, Ellington Parkway here in Nashville and um, a guy sped past me, cut in front of me, and then just kept going. And I was mad. I mean, I wasn't just mad. I was irate. So I did the only thing I knew to do at that time. And, and as I started flashing my lights and honking my horn as if that was going to do something, right? And he just kept going. I think he was completely oblivious to the fact that he had cut me off or was doing whatever to inconvenience me while I was having a mild panic attack in my little Honda Accord. But in that moment of just frustration and anger, this little voice just said, man, you sure showed him, didn't you, Jason? Right? Like, no, I didn't. And it was that moment of, of otherworldly transcendence that just spoke a truth into my life of like, really, like your reaction to that was completely unnecessary and really did nothing to benefit anybody, including yourself. These moments of otherworldly transcendence are moments that Tracy Balzer calls thin places. She defines thin places as this. It's places where the Holy Spirit of God seems as near as your breath. I like to think of thin places like this. It's places where um, the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit intersects with our reality, right? Uh, maybe our, our, our emotional reality or our physical or mental or spiritual reality, but God's Spirit and our present reality begin to sort of um, converge at these moments, well, today we're going to look at a story in John chapter 4 of an example of a thin place. Because here's what I think. I think sometimes that we think these moments of transcendence have to be kind of on a seasonal basis or maybe every now and then. But what I want to show you is that I think God longs for these moments daily with us. So we're going to look at an example of this in John chapter 4, and then I want to unpack for you how I think that we can have these moments of deep otherworldly transcendence, these thin places in our everyday life. 
Now, if you don't have a Bible, that's totally cool. Um, there are a couple of great online Bibles you can download. I'll put a link to some of those um, in uh, attached to this video so you can kind of follow along as well. But here we are in John chapter 4. Let me kind of set up the story for you before we dive in. Jesus has been on this incredible um, m like ministry tour. I mean, he has been teaching people what it means to follow God. He's been ushering in what he calls the kingdom of God. Um, he's been healing the sick. He's been casting out demons. It's been an incredible time in the life of Jesus and to be one of his followers. Well, they're in a place in Israel where they've got to get from the north part to the south part kind of quickly. And as we all know from basic third grade geometry, the shortest distance between two points is a what? Straight line, right? So he's got to kind of go in a straight line. But what that means is it's going to take him through a region of Israel called um, Samaria. Now, Samaria was filled with, wait for it, Samaritans. And Samaritans were considered to be the enemies of the Jews, right? So think about the person that just most irates you, right? The person that you would consider to be your enemy, the person that's that their life goal, it seems, is to make your life hard, difficult, and just miserable for you. Maybe it's a coworker or maybe a, a political rival or um, a, 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 some other kind of relational rival. Or for me, it's the guy who cuts me off in the drive through line, even though I put my order before his. Like whoever that person is for you, that's kind of what the Samaritans were to the Jews. Well, what we see here is that Jesus is on his way through Samaria with his apprentices, and they decide to stop for lunch in a town of Sychar. Here we are in John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Check this out. It says this, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, pause there for a moment. There were three types of people that the Jews were absolutely forbidden to interact with. The first were non-Jews, what they called Gentiles or pagans. It's basically everybody who wasn't a Jew. The second was women. See, in first century Palestine, women were considered to be really second-class citizens. And it's unfortunate because women have so much to offer, especially the spiritual life of uh, us today. Uh, but in this particular moment or in this particular um, region, women were considered to be less than. So here we have Jesus talking to a non-Jewish woman. This is like a big no-no for religious Jewish culture. The third type of person that Jews were not allowed to associate with is people who have chronic problems, maybe a health problem or maybe an emotional problem or even a relational problem. And we're going to see that Jesus decides to go for broke and break all three of those cultural norms in this story. So that's where we are right now. So Jesus having this conversation with this woman at the well, and he asks her for a drink of water, and she is absolutely floored, starting in verse 10, picking up there again. Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, everybody who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of well, water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, what's happening in this moment is that Jesus is revealing in her, or at least on the front part of revealing in her, an opportunity for a thin place to be created. You see, this woman is coming to the well in the middle of the day, which is the hottest part of the day, to get water. Now, in that day and age, when you were going to do an outdoor task such as this, you wanted to generally do it when it was cooler in the day and not the hottest part of the day. So morning or really the evening as well. But here's this woman who's by herself at this well, which means there's something else going on here. We find out what it is here in just a minute. 
Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Way to go, genius. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, verse 27, his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, in this story, there's a few things happening here that I want to show you. Right out of the gate, we see, as I mentioned a minute ago, an opportunity for a thin place to be created. And did you see that in verse 16? Jesus says to the woman, go and call your husband. And her response a verse later is this, I don't have a husband. And I love Jesus' response back to her. He's like, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the guy that you're living with right now, he's not even your husband. Like you can tell in this moment that she is utterly devastated. I mean, she has given up on any sort of healthy relationship. She, in so many ways, I'm sure, feels like she's just been passed from one person to the next. She didn't really probably feel like a, a real person anymore. She's just so emotionally fractured because of just this relational trauma that she has been put through. And what's interesting in this moment is this. You don't see Jesus coming to her and going, you should be ashamed of yourself. You don't see him condemning her or berating her. He doesn't even give her relationship advice. Here is the son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, Yahweh in the flesh, as we talked about last week, having an encounter with her. And instead of berating her or condemning her or demeaning her, he engages with her as a real person, which allows her to move past this issue that she considered to be a core part of her identity. And what's interesting is this. Later on, when she talks about this story, this encounter that she had with Jesus, notice what she says in verse 27. Do you see that? It says this, the disciples come back and in verse 29, when she goes into the city, she tells the people of the city this, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Now, think about that for a moment. To our knowledge, this is the entirety of the conversation. There was no other conversation that happened between Jesus and this woman. But what Jesus did in addressing this woman's singular problem of, of failed relationships and providing a thin place for her to encounter the Spirit of God at work in him and then engaging with this woman, what he did was he allowed her to overcome what I call a spiritual roadblock. She says, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Because for this woman, her identity, her sense of self-worth and her value and her own understanding of who she was, was wrapped up in the fact that she'd had five husbands and couldn't hold down a decent relationship. And so she's now living with a guy who she's afraid to get married to because of what it has turned out in the past. For her, she is guilty of what I call a spiritual roadblock. She had a spiritual roadblock in her life. See, we all have spiritual roadblocks in our own life. There may be moments or maybe even a regular season of feeling disconnected from God or we feel like there's a, a, a roadblock to deeper intimacy spiritually, uh, mentally, or emotionally because of an issue that we think defines us. Or maybe it defines our identity and we just can't get past it. For this woman of Samaria, 
It was her failed relationships. You can see this because as soon as Jesus identifies what it is and then engages with her in that moment without condemnation, without berating her, she's able to press in deeper to get past that spiritual roadblock and engage in a deeper uh, sense of intimacy with the Spirit of God in Jesus of Nazareth. You see this in other places throughout the Bible as well. I think of Exodus chapter 4 where Moses is having a conversation with God. God meets with Moses in this bush that's set on fly, fire but isn't consumed by the fire. And he's having a conversation with Moses. And, and he tells Moses, Moses, the people of Israel have been in slavery for 400 years. And I'm sending you to go and bring them out away from Pharaoh. And in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Exodus Moses says to God, God, you got to send somebody else because I cannot speak very well. I'm not a good orator. I stumble over my words. I can't do this. See, for Moses, his ability to communicate was his roadblock, his spiritual roadblock. You see this later on in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with, with Paul. Paul has been one of the most um, single-handedly, one of the most influential people in church history. He was foundational in, in getting the, the, the message of hope and peace of Jesus out into the world, the rest of the world. And he tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 12 that, that he has this, what he calls a thorn in his flesh, that he has begged God to take it away, take it away. For him, this is his single issue roadblock. It is his sort of spiritual barricade that's keeping him from, in his mind, moving forward. But he says in that moment that what God has done in that, that thorn in his flesh, what God did for Moses in Exodus chapter 4, and what Jesus does with this woman is to say, look, I'm not necessarily going to fix this, but I'm going to show you that there is a way beyond this. And it's in these moments that these thin places become a reality. For you, your, your spiritual roadblock may not be necessarily failed relationships or maybe even an ability to communicate. Maybe for you, your spiritual roadblock is doubt. You have some doubts uh, about the way you think um, God should answer a prayer that you've had for a long time. Maybe you have uh, disappointment. Maybe that's your roadblock is, is you feel like uh, something should have happened, that God should have come through or answered a prayer or, or done this thing for you and it didn't happen. And that's your sort of spiritual roadblock. Maybe for you, it's a woundedness that you're carrying around. And, and you are having a hard time developing intimacy with God or with others or even really an intimacy with yourself and understanding yourself more because of this, this woundedness, this trauma that's happened to you because of something somebody else did or said or something maybe that happened to you, um, even as an accident or, or on purpose as a child, that you're carrying this around. I read a scholar this week or excuse me, an author this week who just said that, that the millennial generation can be defined as the walking wounded. They are the most wounded generation that we've had in the history of America. And if you think about that for a moment, we have experienced countless number of wars and tragedies and, and other issues in our country. But this author was saying that right now, millennials are the most wounded generation that we've ever seen. Maybe for you, your spiritual roadblock is the inability to forgive somebody who has caused you this wound. A lot of times we can discover what our spiritual roadblock is by simply saying something like this out loud. God, I want to trust you, but... And then fill in the blank. Or, or another way of saying is this, God, I'll follow you if... You see, when we are having a conversation with God, or even maybe when we're having a, a conversation with ourselves, whenever we use words like but or if, we begin to discover spiritual roadblocks in our life. And a lot of times those thin places are the places where those spiritual roadblocks begin to be seen and known and exposed. And sometimes that's really uncomfortable. But 
Remember what happened when Jesus was talking with this woman and her spiritual roadblock of failed relationships became apparent. He didn't condemn her. He doesn't berate her. He doesn't even try to give her advice. Instead, what he does is he simply allows that moment to exist. And then he insists that it's these moments that God, our Father, Yahweh, our Father, is looking for. Look back at chapter 4, verse 23 again, the first part of 23. It says this. It says, The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. There's two words there, spirit and truth, that really need to kind of be unpacked for a minute. The first word is spirit. Spirit, the Greek word for spirit is the word pneuma. Now, pneuma has a lot of different understandings to it, and it's actually most closely connected to the Hebrew word ruach. Now, pneuma and ruach can be translated spirit, but they can also be translated wind or breath. It's that same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1 when the author of Genesis is talking about the creation of the world. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And the spirit or the ruach or the pneuma of God was hovering over the face of the deep. It's that same word that's used in John chapter 3. Just right before the story where Jesus is having a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. And Jesus says to him, he says that everybody who was born of the Spirit blows around like the Spirit does. You don't know where the Spirit's coming, just like you don't know where the wind is coming from, and you don't know where it's going. And everybody who is born of the Spirit is the same way. Everybody who, who is born of the Numa or Ruach is of the same way. You also see this in Acts chapter 2, where the, the what people would call the birth of the church, where Jesus' apprentices, his disciples, are upstairs in this room gathered. And they're praying, and Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Numa to come. And it says that they're all gathered together, and they're praying, and they're waiting, and all of a sudden, a mighty rushing wind comes from heaven and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. It says a mighty rushing pneuma comes from heaven and they are filled with the Holy Pneuma. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He says that those who will worship God truthfully will worship him in the pneuma, in the spirit, in the soul depths. But then he also throws this other word out there. It's the word truth. The Greek word for truth is the word aletheia. Now, when we think about truth, a lot of times we think of it in contrast to lies. And there is some sense of that happening here, but that's actually not at its core what this word means. The word aletheia that Jesus uses here, the opposite of it is not lies, but imitation. When we lived overseas, my family and I lived overseas for a few years, and one of the things that I missed the most living in a Middle Eastern country was ice cold sweet tea. I mean, I just, I craved it all the time. So we would make it at its at our house and we'd invite friends over. I kind of became a sweet tea evangelist. I was like, man, you got to try this. It's really good. Sometimes we'd crush a little bit of mint or put just a little bit of lemon in there to make it just really awesome and robust and just sweet and ice cold. It was amazing. Well, I remember one day I was hanging out with a friend of mine and he got really excited. He's like, oh my gosh, you've got to come to my house. I have something I want you to try. And I was like, okay. So we go to his house. It's about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, pretty hot in the day. And uh, we're sitting in there. It's like August. We're sweating because they didn't really have air conditioning. And as we're sitting there having this conversation, he's like, I'll be right back. He goes to his kitchen and he comes back and he brings this tray full of, of uh, uh, like nuts and dates and raisins, like really good stuff. And then he says, here you go. And he brings me this mug of this kind of brownish liquid and ice cubes are floating in it. And I was like, wow. I said, what, what is this? He goes, this is sweet tea. And I was like, man, I said, did you make this? He said, no, I found it. And I thought, that's kind of strange, but okay, like that, that works. And he's very excited. And he's kind of like, he's like, all right, go ahead and try it. 
and he's kind of watching me. It's, it was a little creepy now that I think about it. And so I, I pick it up and I take a sip and the moment it hit my tongue, I knew I was in trouble because this did not taste like sweet tea. It tasted like something completely otherworldly and not in a good way. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, wow. But I had to fake it. Like I was like, oh man, yeah, this is this is something. Like, what what is it? And he goes, let me show you. And he runs to the kitchen and he comes back with a six pack of canned nest tea, and it was peach flavored. And I was like, that explains a lot. And I was very gracious and I was very grateful for his excitement. But I said, man, I, I need to explain to you that this isn't real. This is a cheap imitation of the real thing. If you want the real thing, come to my house. I will make you the real thing, right? We've all had imitations of other things. And what Jesus is getting at here is this, that those who really want to connect with God in the thin places have to be willing to connect with him on a soul level and in deep authenticity. Sometimes, and I think so many times, it's a defense mechanism, but we walk around with an imitation version of the real us. Right, you meet people all the time and you're like, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm good. And you put on that kind of fake smile when the reality is, is you're hurting. You're one of the walking wounded. You you are incredibly um, anxiety ridden and stress ridden. You didn't sleep last night because you're worried about how this particular situation is going to work out or what about this relationship. And these things continue to plague us. And what Jesus says is this, is that those who worship God must worship him in spirit, in ruach, in numa, in the deep soul level, and in authenticity. God can handle the fact that you are struggling right now. You don't have to be an imitated version of yourself. Simply be real. Be honest about the trauma and the conflict that you're experiencing in your soul. Be honest about the, the, the feelings of depression that you're having. Be real about the anxiety that you're feeling because of financial stress or relational stress or emotional stress caused from years of woundedness. Just be real. Don't be an imitation or a fake version of yourself. But there's something else that's happening here that's really interesting is this. The second part of this verse, it says this. Not only, not only are we seeing that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, it says this, that the Father is actually looking for people to find him. Here's what's amazing about that. That word looking for, or, or your version may say searching, is the word zateo. And it's a, it's a Greek word that means not just like, oh yeah, kind of casually looking around. It, it's the equivalent of going on a treasure hunt. You ever lost your keys, right? You ever like lost your wallet? Like what do you do? You do everything you can. Like everything around you stops until you can find that thing, your wallet, your keys. Some of us are looking for a spouse. Some of us are looking for a job. It's like everything kind of goes on hold until you find that thing. That's the same word that's used here. Jesus is saying this, Yahweh, our father, God is seeking. He's looking. He is on a treasure hunt to find people who are willing to worship him, to engage with him, to be um, connected to him and the thin places where spirit and reality come together, where you're the real you, the authentic version of you and your soul come alive because you are meeting with him and his spirit and his authentic self. If we're completely honest, this is so hard for us. We tend to run away or at least avoid these spaces, these thin places, because they can be very uncomfortable. It could even be said that rather than living in the thin places, 
where God's spirit and the real version of ourselves, our reality intersect, we would actually prefer to live in the thick places where life is busy, where we are distracted, and we keep treading water even though we are sinking. But the truth is, it's in these thin places where healing, where, where transcendence, where a deep connectivity with God happens. So how do we do that? In our everyday, how do we create thin spaces? Our tendency, our natural bent is toward creating thick places, which means that to create thin spaces is going to take some work. Now that's the bad news, is it takes effort. You can't just try it and see what happens. It's something we've got to train ourselves to do. It's a discipline of sorts. So what I want to do is I want to give you four things to do this week to help create thin spaces in your life. Now, just because you practice these four things this week, all right, here's my disclaimer. It does not mean that every time you're going to have a life transforming experience. However, if what Jesus said is true, that the Father God, Yahweh, is looking and desperately seeking people to engage with him in these thin places, then what do we have to lose, right? So here's the first thing. And this is going to probably be the most difficult thing, but here it is. You ready? Slow down. Slow down. The number one answer I get when I talk with people about how they're doing is I'm great, I'm just busy. You probably said that in your mind, right? I'm good, I'm just busy. I've said it, like I've felt it. Lisa Tolan wrote an article in NBC News uh, last year and she says it this way. Uh, she says that being busy for us in our present day and age isn't an excuse or a lament anymore. Like we're not sorry for being busy. She actually says that this, she says it's a sign of status. Right? We get our identity. We get our, our feeling of worth and self-importance by how busy we are, right? Because we think that busyness means, oh, more people need us. More people desire our, uh, our attention or our, what we have to offer. And so we become increasingly more and more busy. But the problem is, is when the more busy we become, the thicker our lives become and the more or really the less we're able to deal with that trauma that is really at the core of who we are. The more the place becomes thick, the less it becomes thin. And it's in those thin spaces that we really need God to move. So just slow down, take five minutes and just breathe. A way you can do that is the second thing here, and that's you can get up early and simply ask God to meet with you. And this is something that I, I've started doing. Uh, I get up around five in the morning and um, I program my coffee maker to have the coffee ready for me by five. So that way when I wake up, I, I don't feel like I am going to die, right? So I wake up at five and I pour myself a cup of coffee and I sit in my chair. I open up the blinds so I can look out and just see the trees and see my yard and just kind of see nature. And, uh, and I just simply sit in that moment for a few minutes. I don't cut my phone on. I don't put headphones in. I don't cut on my email. I, do, I just simply sit in that moment, most of the time in darkness, and just simply sit with my cup of coffee, and I just say, God, I'm here. I, I'm, I'm present. I ask the Holy Spirit to bring to the surface these things that I've been trying to push down. Maybe I tried to push them down the day before or in those moments, and it's usually in those moments that the Holy Spirit begins to bring stuff to my mind of, man, I really need to maybe go back and ask for forgiveness for saying that thing to that person or and today, I really need to make sure that I'm present in the moment with my kids rather than rushing from one thing to the next. Or, man, God, thank you so much just for this moment of silence and stillness before you with a cup of coffee, listening to the birds outside. Just get up early. Those are natural moments of thin places. Or the third is this. You can spend time in community with other people. This is, uh, for me, when I find a great opportunity for thin space to be created, 
It's moments where uh, I'm hanging out with friends or whatever that, that the, the Holy Spirit just speaks to me in those great moments of awe and wonder and laughter and joy and making memories together. And what happens a lot of times is, is um, I'm able to develop relationships in those moments in that community where I'm able to talk about spiritual roadblocks even in my own life. There's a group of guys that I, I talk with on a regular basis and um, we regularly call each other and go, hey man, um, I know last time we talked, you'd mentioned this particular issue. How's that going? Uh, are you making any progress there? How can I help you? Do you need me to ask you harder questions or, or what do you need me to do? Cre community creates opportunities for thin space to happen. Now is a great time if you're not involved in one of our community groups. Now is a fantastic time to get involved. You can email us here at the church at church at hopechurchnashville.com and we can connect you to a community group and really experience uh, thin places in the midst of being around other people. The fourth and really the last one is this. And it says to regularly expose yourself to people or ideas that will challenge you. So often I think that we fall into the trap of only listening to voices that reaffirm our outlook on life rather than pressing in to see whether or not that those voices that we're listening to regularly are telling us who we are um, or are they telling us who we should be rather than allowing the Holy Spirit through scripture or through um, good conversations with close friends to shape us into who we are. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want I want to give you a challenge. Okay, take the next twenty four hours, or if you're feeling more bold, maybe the next few days, and I want you to um, disconnect from your normal uh, or maybe um, continual media outlet. Maybe for some of you, that's that's the news media, right? So, cut off CNN, turn off Fox News, turn off Rachel Ray or Joe Rogan or wherever it is you're getting your news. Like, turn that off right, for just 24 hours or, or longer, and just see how that begins to affect you and inform your life. Maybe for some of you, it, it's taking a break or pushing pause on your social media, right? So cutting off Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or however you're getting your social media fixed, but just kind of push pause on that for 24 hours and just take a break. And in those moments where you'd be tempted to kind of post something or check in on something or whatever, just allow that to expose maybe the spiritual roadblocks that you have kind of set up in your life that keep you from really diving in deeper or meeting God in these thin places. And if you're looking for something to do, um, let me give you a few places to start. Um, for those of you who are readers uh, or maybe you like audiobooks, here's a couple of great places to start. One is uh, I would just start with one of the biographies of Jesus. Um, the the uh, New Testament calls them the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are four great biographies on um, the teachings and the life of our Rabbi Jesus. He's just a, a phenomenal person to get to know through this text. Um, you can also um, read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Um, it's a great book on just kind of some of the, the fundamentals of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Um, a couple others, Dallas Willard wrote a book called Renovation of the Heart. And um, Richard Foster wrote two different books, one on prayer and one called The Celebration of Discipline that are great. I'm going to put links to all of this um, attached to this video so that you can, you can click on those and order them or follow them. Um, if you're not a book person, um, podcasts are another great way of kind of going deeper in this. Um, two podcasts real quick that I, I found incredibly helpful. One is called The Bridgetown Daily. Um, and another one is called um, The Emotionally Healthy Podcast. It's by a guy named Pete Scazzaro. Um, you can also, in the month of August, we're going to be hitting you every day in your inbox with something called Hope for Today. And we're going to start this um, August 3rd, Monday, August 3rd. And it's going to be a daily encouragement that helps you connect with God in those thin spaces, just providing five to 10 minutes every morning for you to be able to really go deeper in your walk with Jesus and meeting with God in those thin places so that life transformation can actually get you um really gets you down that road to deeper intimacy with God and with others. If you want to subscribe to that, there'll be a link below you can click on and uh, we will make sure that you get notified. Well, Hope Church, thank you so much for your time. Um, as always, my hope and my prayer is that this has been an encouragement to you. And um, my hope and my prayer for you right now is that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he would make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you his peace, especially in those thin places places. Hope Church, 
you are sent.